several months ago, um, we were all kind of left reeling by what was happening in our world. And um, I, I just have to admit to you, there were days when I did not know what to do. Last Sunday, I, I celebrated my 39th year as a pastor the first Sunday that I ever preached was, was June the 14th in the last century. <laughs> and I thought I had seen it all and experienced it all. And so we began to pray together as a staff, and your board began to pray, and we just began to ask God to show us what to do. And I really think the Lord led us through the time of quarantine. And if you were able to watch the services online, you would know that almost every week, the message that the Lord laid on our heart was a message of encouragement, a message of how to weather the storms of life, because we found ourselves in the midst of the storms. What to do when our world doesn't, doesn't behave the way we want it to or think it should? And so as we began to come out of the quarantine and began to come back together to worship, you'll remember it was on Pentecost Sunday that we were able to, for the first time, come back together as a family. Many still cannot, but that was the Sunday. And you know, it was that week prior to that that the Lord really began to lay on my heart, my times of prayer, it's time for the church to stand up and realize this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to really begin to make a difference in our world. And as I started to study the lives of the disciples in the days after the death of Jesus, I began to see, as we know, that um, they struggled. They struggled greatly. Because they had invested so much time and energy in following the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the way that they were accustomed to living life was suddenly changed without warning. 
And they were left questioning, where do we go from here? And it's almost as if those days, those three days the Lord was in the tomb, He was saying to them, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. When He reappeared to them, they, they kind of thought, well, we're going to go back to the way it's always been. Little did they know what the Lord had in store for them. And on that day of Pentecost, the disciples of Jesus went through an amazing transformation. A transformation that became evident to all who read of them and all who knew them at that point in time. That transformation took them to the place where facing things like arrest and, and, and warnings and threats and beatings, beatings saw them turning their struggles into opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you'll remember after the Lord was crucified, what did the disciples do? They ran and hid. They fled. They were afraid. They didn't know what to do. After the events of Pentecost, they were transformed individuals. They were changed. Last Sunday morning, we looked at two of those disciples of the Lord, Peter and John. And we looked at a confrontation that they had with the religious officials of their day and how they stood their ground. They did not back down, leaving those officials wondering, what are we going to do with these guys? We can't shut them up, so we'll just warn them, tell them to keep their mouth shut, and we'll, we'll all be good. I want you to listen to our first text this morning. It's found in Acts chapter 4. It begins in verse 23, and this takes up kind of where we left off last week. It says, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. After that scary confrontation of last week, they go back to familiar surroundings, back to familiar people. But instead of going back to the familiar ways, instead of running and hiding, what do they do? They go to prayer. They began to pray for God's will to be done in their life. You want to know what happened? Jump down a few verses. Verse 31 of Acts chapter 4. This takes up after their prayer time. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Now, as they prayed, can I just tell you, the place where they were was not the only thing that was shaken. Their lives were shaken. Their lives were changed. In fact, they experienced such a life change that they really began to make a difference. They went from being defeated to being victorious. They went from hiding to being open to new things that the Lord had in store. But I believe that the biggest difference that we see in the lives of these people is found in verse 32 where it talks about them being of one heart and one mind. It's kind of like when we were over in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. It talked about all of those gathered were in one accord. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be one heart and one mind? What does it mean to be of one accord? Well, if people do something in one accord, it means that they do it together. It means they do it at the same time. It means they do it with a desire to see the end results be what God intends for those results to be. Now, the Greek word that is used here is quite unique in the fact that it's, um, it has a dual meaning. It's a compound word that means to rush along, and it means to do something in unison. Now, I'm not a musician. 
I don't understand musical terms. I can pat my foot and clap my hands, but it may not always be in the time that you're supposed to. I know what I like in music, but yet I don't understand everything. What puzzles me most is how different instruments can play different sounds, maybe even different notes, and yet it all comes together as good music. That's the definition of what took place on the day of Pentecost. That's the definition of what took place here in this place where they are gathered together for prayer. They are praying different ways. They are saying different words to the Lord. They're sharing their heart, but yet they are doing it in unison. They are creating a beautiful symphony before the Lord. Now, what makes this time so different from times before? I believe it's because it comes on the hills of great fear, great struggle, great uncertainty. And you know what? That causes us to ask the question, what kind of change will help us through these days? What kind of change does the church need to experience in the year 2020? Better yet, let's make it more personal. What kind of change do you need? What kind of change do I need? Well, I want to share three of them from this, these passages of Scripture. And the first change is that we need a change that reinforces our need to be of one heart and one mind. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you on your way to church this morning thought, you know what, today's the day we're just going to be all together. We're going to be of one heart and one mind. Well, the question in my mind is this. In our divided world, is it possible to be of one heart and one mind? If I were to open up the floor this morning and we were to start talking politics, we would be light years apart on some issues. I mean, you think about it. Look at our world. There are issues of gender and race and marriage and family and education. And, and we appear to be in an impasse in some of these areas. And, and we think, well, you know, Pastor, this is the church and the church is different, right? Well, unfortunately not. In fact, there are times when we as a church would have to describe ourselves as, well, we're just not on the same page. Man, there are times when we're not even in the same book, much less the same page. Do you want to know why? I figured it out. I really did. As I was reading and studying and praying and, and putting all of these things into a way that I could understand what's going on today, I can tell you why... We are at such an impasse. Are you ready? I'm serious. Are you ready? It's because we all, every single one of us, we have our personal preferences. We have our personal likes and dislikes, ideas and ideals. We have our own desires. We have our own thinking, way of thinking. This is how things should be. Now, in that list that I just rattled off, what's missing? I'll tell you what's missing. God's will, God's desires. We come into this place we call church, and I guess we all do. I mean, we all have our own preferences. I talked about music a moment ago. I guarantee you if we all had iTunes or, or iPods or iPads and these things with different music, yours would be different than mine in most situations. I like it all. I've got everything from big band to rock and roll. I've got everything from country to Christian. I, I like it all. But you know, we have our preferences to the point that when we pray, it's Lord help people to see this is what needs to happen. Instead of praying, God, how do you want to change me? What is your desire for the church? To be of one heart requires common desire. No distractions, no exceptions. It means I'm not going to come in here and demand my way. It means, Lord, we're going to seek your will for us. We're going to seek your will for this place. That's being of one heart. 
Well, what does it mean to be of one mind? It means that, well, we have a common mindset that we desire for the Holy Spirit to direct our thought process. It means, and I know this is probably going to be the toughest thing you hear today, it means keeping your opinions to yourself. Now, I'm not saying you have to be mealy-mouthed and spineless. I'm just saying there are times when we need to shut up and let the Holy Spirit talk. When we need to allow God to move in our midst. When we need to be seeking Him instead of trying to push our agenda. That's the kind of oneness, oneness of mind and oneness of heart that is described right here in the book of Acts. It's a unity that is created by selfless desire, laying aside our personal wants for the good of the whole body. That's a major change, is it not? But isn't that what we need to see happening? If we want to see results like we read of here in the book of Acts, the answer is yes, this is what we need. You still with me? Well, here's the second change. That in, it, in it, we need a change that enables us to testify to the life-changing power of Jesus. To really testify to the life-changing power of Jesus. Would you let me read verse 33 for you again? It says, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. With great power, they testified about Jesus. Not about themselves. And you're wondering, well, Pastor, why such an emphasis on testimony? Didn't we look at that last week? Yes, we did. But yet I think the reason that we need to focus on it again is because there are times when we are notorious for making everything about us. We are where our focus lies. And that's the way we were brought up. I mean, that's the way we've lived our lives. We all like a little bit of attention. We all like to be thought of as being intelligent. So maybe we should keep our mouth shut more often. But the testimony, surely they talked about how their lives were changed, but they would not allow themselves to be the focus. They were not the center of attention. It was, no, 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 don't, don't look at... Look at what God can do in a life that was controlled by sin. Their focus was on God and on God's grace. Look at verse 33 again, where it talks about much grace being upon them. I call that evident grace. In other words, it's a grace that you could see in their lives. People knew that something had happened. People knew that they had been changed. It's a life-changing grace that draws us closer to Jesus and allows Him the opportunity to work through us so that others can be drawn to Him as well. That's the kind of grace that we need. That's the kind of grace that should be heard in the words of our testimony. Pointing people to Jesus instead of to us. And you're thinking, okay, pastor, you've talked about how one of the greatest ways of evangelism is to win people to us so we can win them to Jesus. I'm talking about winning them through the grace of God that is seen in your changed life. Being who God created you to be, loving God above all else, and letting yourself be used to make a difference in your world. Okay? Here's the third change. We need a change that prepares us to be a force in our world for Jesus. To be a force in our world for Jesus. Let me read verse 34 and 35 again. There were no needy among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sale, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Now, the book of Acts shows us how and why the early Christians became a force to be reckoned with. It was because... I want you to hear me. They didn't just talk about loving God and loving others. 
They did it. They did it. And it was obvious in everyone around them, this is what is taking place. Jesus has made a change in their lives to the point that I I had to read that one section over four or five times when it said there were no needy persons among them. And I thought, wait a minute, we're all needy to some point, aren't we? But what it's telling us is the church allowed themselves to be used of God to meet needs. That enabled them to become a force in their society. Now, when I read Scripture, I I can't help but zero in on on words. and, And I always ask myself, okay, is there something I'm not seeing here? Is there a deeper meaning, something that we don't see on the surface, but yet something maybe we ought to be hearing? And that was part of it when it said no needy persons. But there was another word that stood out to me. It's found in verse 35 there. It's the word anyone. And I thought, okay, that could be, um, that could be a pretty broad meaning there. But as I looked at it more closely, I began to remember when Jesus talked about how anyone can bring offerings. Anyone can make a sacrifice. Anyone can do good things. But that's not what's important. What is most important is that anyone who truly loves Jesus will desire to be changed and will want to have a part in changing anyone who has needs, whether they're spiritual, physical, financial, emotional. And you want to talk about being a force in your world today? The world needs good news. And the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ, of how the Lord can forgive you of your sins and transform your life to where it will be evident that you have been changed. They will be able to see the grace of God flowing through you. In fact, that's why after Pentecost in the Bible, we begin to see society changing. Yeah, there was a lot more opposition But there were thousands of people coming to know Jesus because these individuals decided that we've come through difficult situations, uncertainty and fear, and we can either just continue to exist and hope that everything just gets back to normal or we can take the bull by the horns. We can charge forth into our world. And we can let people see firsthand the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we as the church should be? And isn't that what we should be doing? All because the followers of Jesus came together in oneness. One heart, one mind, one desire, one focus, one goal. It may have looked different in everybody, but yet... The end results were in sight. It was a oneness of heart and mind and a desire that even today continues to urge us to do something, prepare us to do something, and equip us as believers to go out and change our world. Today, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual life, would you just let me tell you That God can help you. God can change you. God can use you to make an impact in a hurting world, a confused world, a world that is in turmoil. We can be a voice of reason. We can be a voice of peace, of love, of grace, and of change. If we will just do it. If we will open our heart to God's Holy Spirit. Jesus, this morning, we are thankful for the powerful words of Scripture. And as we have read this passage many, many times, I think it came to life more than ever before these past few weeks. As we began to study and and to see how life can be changed. We pray this morning that you would help each of us today to be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. 
I pray that you would help our hearts and minds to be open to whatever you have in store for us, whatever you have in store for your church. We want to be a part, Lord, of changing society, of changing a culture. We want to point people back to you. Father, would you forgive us today of the times when we failed to be what you desired us to be? We pray that you would please come and, and fill our heart and fill our lives to cleanse us, to change us. Help us, Lord, to not let this opportunity slip away. Help us to capitalize on this chance to be different and to help our world be different as well. Fill our heart, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God.